Yes, guys, welcome back to the Canon Podcast. How are you? We hope you're doing very, very well. I'm in unfamiliar surroundings. My sister's. Uh, have a look at look at her wine glass collection. Lovely stuff. What a, what a glimpse. What a special preview. Um, hope you're all doing very, very well. Uh, George and I background. just did. It's it's honestly it's riveting stuff. It's really good. It's, it's unbelievable insight. This is what people expect from the Canon Podcast. Um, the uh, we just did a rewatch of the Leon uh, the Leon game. We want to do some scouting more scouting stuff as well. Uh, George and I have this like midweek slot free. So if there's anything that you guys want to see in terms of stuff on the Patreon side, but also on the YouTube side as well, uh, YouTube members as well, um, yeah, let us know because if there's you know scouting or bits of tactics you want us to go into, we're, we're happy to do that. We're happy to take requests and stuff. So please do let us know. But yeah, we just did a whole rewatch of the Leon game got into a debate about Martinelli at the end which was quite interesting um uh we hate him well I hate him certainly obviously um but we want to discuss Zinchenko um we've seen Zinchenko have a little bit of a new role uh, we want to have a look at some sort of uh, we can't show footage in the same way we can on the Patreon YouTube side so we we save that for over there we've got some screenshots of Zinchenko's new role um and sort of how Arteta and sort of Arsenal using him in this preseason. Before we have a look at those, um, I think it is worth saying that, yes, there is a new role, which we'll come to, but you, you've sort of been making this point. Zinchenko has improved. And I think it's kind of worth saying mm-hmm. that and, and 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 worth highlighting that as well. And, and also giving credit to Zinchenko because I think, yes, he's improved and we'll come on to, to why and the, and, the, and the little tweaks that have been made. But there feels like there's been a bit of a flip in this preseason, which is, is exciting. And, and we also want to talk about sort of rediscovering some other assets as well. Yeah, I, I think like... For, from a rediscovering assets point of view, I think that, you know, Mikel and the squad in general need to have um, a level of improvement in squad management. That's just fundamentally something that I think everybody can agree with um, across the fan base. And rediscovering assets are an important part of that. To transition and bridge into Zinchenko, I think this is a really important point. Um, so there's been a really marketed improvement for me in terms of how sharp he's looked technically, which wasn't there last season. And it seems to have lit a fire under him. And I don't think he wants to lose himself on the fringes of the squad. There's been a real purpose, a real messaging on his passes. And he's been really incisive through the thirds where I felt like last time there were moments, or not last time, but last season, there were moments where he was just very loose technically. Now, some people might say, well, what do you expect from somebody in and out of the team from injury and whatnot? I think it went a little bit beyond that. The decision making in terms of the passes that he was attempting they weren't as um, as purposeful. They weren't finding their man as quickly. And I'm okay with loose moments technically, but when the decision-making is paired with loose moments, which is then paired with defensive frailty, there's rightful criticism that people are going to have of the player. But I think, you know, between this offseason, I do feel that Arsenal were happy to let him go. I do feel that he was put up on a list that could have gone and I don't think anybody answered the call. And I think he got frustrated mm. and he changed his agents and he's sitting there saying, okay, am I at risk of doing another city where I'm part of a successful team, but I'm not actively playing? Do I, Am I in that scenario again? And am I in a scenario where my career is going where people don't want me? And that is, that is all part of him changing his number. It's all part of him maybe having a look within himself to say, I can do more. And I can find my voice because I felt like at times last season with the introduction of Jorginho, a high touch controller, Martin Odegaard shifting to a more middle third role. Again, high touch controller in the middle third. Zinchenko himself, the same kind of role. Is there overlap? Is there a little bit of redundancy in voice when you've got two high touch players in deep buildup? And did he lose himself? Did he lose his, his, uh, his voice back there? And I think that there was a level of individual responsibility he took beyond the structure changes that we're hopefully going to show to show how we've maximized him. But there is a level of, well done, lad. Like, you've looked at yourself and you've changed things. <laughs> well done, lad. <laughs> Such a British phrase. Um, yeah, no, I, th- I think you're bang on. I think you're bang on, George. I, I think also in that sort of maturity, I, I, I don't know, this is maybe slightly unfounded and I'm sort of saying this on the fly, so forgive me, but... I did feel first season that Zinchenko and Jesus, they came in and they, they were absolutely brilliant. But there was, a, certainly in the media and their messaging, there was a little bit of us and them. Yeah. And there was a little bit of, we've been winners and you guys need to come to our level. But I think last season showed that like, we're still brilliant, even when Jesus and Zinchenko aren't necessarily at the absolute forefront of that. And I'm sure that would have had a bit of a, you know, you're coming into a team that sort of, you know, at the time had just finished fifth and whatever, and you're sort of going, okay, let me show you how to become a, a winner, you know, a, t- a title winner. 
And now, you know, we've kind of shown Zinchenko, okay, we're actually, but we are at that level. And, you know, you need to join us, which is, which must be from, from his perspective, you know, quite a, a tricky thing to manage. Let's have a look at these uh, screenshots. So uh, can I have a look at the first one in here. I think we're seeing this. These are all from the Leon game, which again, you can check out the rewatch um, we, uh, for the full clips and, and so on and so forth. But there's a number of things that I uh, probably want to discuss. I'll sort of le- uh, lay this sort of the overlay and you can maybe fill in the detail here. But I think the the idea of Zinchenko as that kind of primary first receiver is there. Um, the idea of Zinchenko is space to to move. He's not being asked to receive higher at the pitch with you know defenders in his back or whatever. He's facing play. He's got time. I think we all know Zinchenko has the quality to, from these sorts of positions, play any kind of pass. He can play that switch out to Osaka. He can play that ball over the top to Martinelli, which he did a number of times. This could have been the situation where he plays this lovely through ball through here to Kai Havertz. So there's a number of situations. And I think that maximizes Gabriel, which maybe you can come to in a second. We can also see him in this kind of staggered moment with, with Thomas Partey. And we sort of saw that throughout the the course of the uh, of the game. We've seen, of course, Zinchenko coming into midfield as the inverted mid, uh, you know, left back or whatever it might be, whatever you want to call it. Some people don't even like that phrase. But I think before he's been higher, he's allowed himself a little bit more freedom to come further over into these types of zones over here. He's not always been the first receiver. He's not always had time on the ball. Um, but I think we'll see through these screenshots that there's the little tweaks are sort of maximizing him. But yeah, uh, you can go ahead and fill in the detail. Yeah, there's there's three big things, like lessons at least, that I'd want everybody to see. Look, Gabriel's defending the wide channel. That switch, by the way, I saw it last season. This isn't new. I saw it with Kivior and Gabriel quite a bit. There was moments that we tested this and build up. But right now, there's, you know, the, the, the fact that the wide channel's covered by Gabriel, it eliminates the defensive frailty point on Zinchenko on, on the outside, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is when we stagger the pivot like this, Thomas Partey being a little bit higher up. This is what I was talking about earlier in terms of losing his voice. Last year, that was Jorginho. And Jorginho is somebody that likes to drop in those exact same z- zones that Zinchenko is in right now. And maybe there's a conflict. There's a conflict of too many cooks in the kitchen. Here, we strike the balance really well because Thomas Partey is perfectly comfortable playing higher and being the second receiver, the one to receive in the block. That makes the best use of him. Zinchenko, while he can do it, I think his primary skill, his superpower is in this zone. Look at the space that Leon affords Zinchenko and they're not allowed to jump if they jump, by the way. And if, you know, that kind of attacking midfielder jump, there's a huge hole for Kai Havertz to run into. So he can't jump. And the reason that that's the case is because A, Thomas Partey's a little bit higher up in the eight, gives Zinchenko that opportunity to be the first receiver. Next, he is the left center back in essence in that back four. And again, he's stepping into space with the game in front of him. And when you've got time, Zinchenko with time is potent. That That is key. Whereas last season, I felt like, okay, I will invert from left back, meaning I will go from a really wide position and I will almost move inside and step up. Whereas here, it felt like he's stepping back a little bit more. And that extra five to 10 yards gives him the time and space that he needs to not feel hurried, but also the time and space he needs to hurt opposition. Whereas before, it was, okay, Zinchenko will invert, but he'll stay high, he'll stay in the block, and that block is covered. So Zinchenko never gets the ball, and he becomes less influential, and you're sitting there highlighting his defensive weaknesses. Whereas right now, you're saying, okay, wow, I can see your personality on the ball. Gabrielle is no longer leading the buildup, which is his weakness. Zinchenko's in a role that he prefers. Partey's in a role that he prefers. And that side looks a lot more fluid. You start seeing balls over the top from Zinchenko. You start seeing through balls to for Martinelli to run into. You start to see a left-hand side that functions a little bit better. And I get excited when Califiore is coming in because this is exactly how we're going to use him. And it excites me because I think Califiore has got another level both technically in the carry, but also defensively. We all know the difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, in some ways you can view this from a perspective of going, okay, what scenario would I love to have Zinchenko in? And if you said to me, okay, you know, absolutely maximize you know, Zinchenko on the pitch for you, where would he be? This screenshot is it. 
he's got the balls over the top. He's got the balls into midfield. He's got room to carry. He can go over to Saka with a switch. He can go back to Gabriel and go out. Well, you know, he's got that sort of sort of quality. But you'd never want Zinchenko as that kind of, let's call it, quarterback all the time. And that's what I think is so brilliant about this is he is being maximised. The messaging on his passing as well, specifically from deep. We saw it in 22-23. These, these are the areas that you absolutely maximise him in. And when he is in that stagger, I think you're so the, the Jorginho thing is a is a really is a really key point. I do worry about Zinchenko and Jorginho as a pairing. I think did, did we see them in preseason? I don't remember, but maybe maybe for a little bit. I, I don't remember it yeah. seeing often. I saw it enough last season to get annoyed. <laughs> yeah, I think it's specifically a game at Stamford Bridge where um yeah, they were both sort of dropping out the block. They were both asking to be sort of the, the first receivers, have lots of touches, that sort of stuff. And it also means that teams can step onto you and stop that happening. But when you have someone who is that sort of flexible uh, option with Zinchenko, it's so nice. And I think also in terms of sort of rediscovering and reinventing this left-hand side, as we're going to, you know, hopefully begin to talk about on the pod and so on and so forth, this is one of those ways. And I kind of want to transition this a little bit into the left-hand side more generally, because I think with Zinchenko, we saw this on the rewatch, it feels like we've got sort of two sides, and you mentioned this in terms of the out-of-possession stuff, in terms of uh, the differences between the two sides. But on the left, I feel like at the moment, with, with Havertz, with Martinelli, even with the Declan Rice, they are more straight line type players. And someone like Zinchenko, you know, I'm not necessarily saying this is the way Arteta ca- you know, will go this season, but it's a way of doing it. Zinchenko behind the ball with stretchers ahead of him could be a way of not only maximising Zinchenko, but maximising a left-hand side, maximising Martinelli. That There's a picture here that if we decide to go down this road, you know, six months ago, three months ago, two months ago, I would have been going, Zinchenko starting the season, absolutely not for me. But if you said to me, Arteta thinks, because of what we have on the left-hand side, Arteta wants to start the season with Havertz, Rice and Martinelli, those are all guys who can, maybe Rice is probably the, the, the least of those, but specifically how about some Martinelli, can make those runs in behind. If Sinchenko can make these passes and pick them out, there's a role there for him. And I, I just don't want to, it's this whole conversation about maximising assets, isn't it? I just don't want to rule it out because I think there's such a, if we can platform in, him in this way, there's something there for him. He he still has something for us. I mean, the Zinchenko of last season is up with Thomas Partey forming a double pivot and Gabriel's in this position and we're struggling to progress. That's that's kind of the simple fact of it. And also, um, I don't know if you can put up that screenshot just a little bit again, because uh, Martin Odegaard and his role change about being in the middle third is a significant one, right? And um, when you start to talk about uh, the interplay between these two, um, this middle third area with basically Thomas Partey flanked by two really high touch progressors is very different if you replace Thomas Partey with Jorginho. And you've got all three in that middle third that are high touch progressors. There's a lot of people that want to do the same thing here. And even this pass, this clip ball over the top, again, Jorginho is somebody that loves that. And so there is a certain overlap and redundancy in voice. That means nobody wants to necessarily receive in the block. Zinchenko wants to be the first one touching it. Jorginho wants to be the first one touching it. Who's the one that's sitting a little bit higher up in the block and saying, here, I'm a wall pass option. They can do it. They don't both. They don't like doing it. So they like to avoid that because they're not physically able to. So they, they know their limits. So it's not a critique on them. It's just that they both understand where they want to be and what areas of the pitch that they prefer. And I just feel like we're doing a much better job, well, Mikel is at least, of something that we've all critiqued him for. Maximize the players that you have, not just the structure. So understand the tweaks that you have to make in order to make the structure shine with the players you have available. Not just relying on, hey, plan A is working. What happens when plan A doesn't work? And this is a way to tweak it. It gets Gabriel in areas that we really want him in, in possession. It gets Zinchenko, Calafiori, even Yuri and Timber. I don't care who you want in terms of the rediscovered assets. No matter what, that left back to left center back switch is a lot better than the left back to inverted pivot switch for many players. Yeah. And yeah, you just yeah. you just start to see a little bit more balance in general. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the, the Thomas Partey point you're making there as well is a good one in terms of maybe slightly highlighting the Marino thing because I think it is, we're not gonna, 
if if you are maximizing a Zinchenko, we we do have those primary first control, you know, first phase sort of controllers in your Zinchenkos and and, and your Jorginhos. We need someone who is going to be able to be a bit more physical, who is going to go and stand in a block. Partey doesn't quite do that. It's more sort of the the central hub, if you want to call it that. But I think Marino is standing a little bit further ahead of Zinchenko, maybe throwing those balls in. I think we said in the scouting as well that Marino's ability to receive in a block and play the pass straight away, I think is really exciting. So there's there's something there. On, on the Calafiori thing, how do you anticipate him being used? Do, do you see it in this way perfectly. or in a slightly perfectly way? this way? Yeah, this is this is how I have, I've always seen him, and it, he effectively is a left center back in possession, and then out of possession offers a little bit more driving runs in terms of being a little bit more of an option on the outside. When we're in deep build up, like in those screenshots that you saw, I think Calafiori is exactly where Zinchenko is. We start to maximize him. This is how him and Gabriel coexist. Then once we get up the pitch, they switch. Gabriel goes back to defend the space out of possession, which Calafiori needs a little bit of work on in wide defending. There are some things where he's over aggressive, but then Calafiori can be that impetus going forward in terms of making either an underlapping run where Marino can be the one on the outside or vice versa, where he's the one that's offering at least an option on the outside with Marino on the inside. It's just about support and it's about different roles in possession and different roles out of possession, both of which yeah. maximize them, which is the idea. Yeah. I want to want to close with this because I think this is a really important thing. It's like Zinchenko's not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> we may want him to, <laughs> but Zinchenko's not going anywhere. He's changed his number. Um, I don't I don't anticipate him leaving this this summer. And we we you know we we could probably talk about this another day with sort of the Fabio Vieiras, the Jakub Kivios, the the you know maybe you and Timbers or you Jesus, whoever you want to talk about, the players who are sort of needing a bit of reintegration and sort of you know coming to terms with what they are for, for, for Arsenal fans. This is the job of a coach, right? The job of a coach is to maximise your assets. And as you said earlier, that we, we've, we've complained about Mikel at times not being able to do that. So I think praise is due. And if we can see, you know, we're still very early. We're not, we're not sort of, we're starting extrapolating out in terms of what Zinchenko can be. But sort of more broadly... I do think that part of the job of a coach is to maximise your assets. We as fans might sit here and say, well, that, there's a shortcoming in that player there, there's a shortcoming in that player there. But Mikel's job is to do this sort of stuff. It's to look at Zinchenko, it's to look at Martinelli and say, okay, Martinelli, maybe your execution in the final third isn't exactly what I need you to be. So how do I support you? I support you with blindside runs or I support you with earlier balls or I support you with whatever it might be. I think as fans, we can get into a sense of that there's the shortcoming, there's the shortcoming, there's the shortcoming. But for me, every shortcoming, there's a flip side. There's a there's a there's a positive somewhere. Don't ask Sinchenko to be out wide defending one on one. It just it just you know every time he makes a mistake out there, it does frustrate me that we have the same conversations. We need to be platforming him better. So I think it's a really good sign just overall. And I'd love to get your take on just that that sense as well on Mikel maximizing assets and and sort of how you see that through the season. I think that's the key evolution for Mikel as a coach, personally. It's if, uh, again, who am I to say? It's one of my, I love Mikel. It's one of my very few uh, criticisms we love Mikel. <laughs> uh, of Mikel that I don't feel at times if plan A doesn't work and he's got to recruit other players or at least supporting players that maybe he doesn't love, it can be an issue. It can be an issue in, or a slow process in terms of integrating these people out of the cold. And this is a way that you can rediscover an asset. And it's, and it's only good for everybody, by the way. Uh, like, as much as I want Zinchenko sold, I want him playing well so that I can get a good fee. As much as I want Zinchenko potentially, or feel maybe that Zinchenko may not be a long-term option, doesn't mean that he's shit and that he's unable to contribute to the team. Very clearly, this is a good player. This is a good player in the right zones, in the right game state. Let's use him in the right zones, in the right game state. And and he has. And there's a level of individual responsibility that you want to praise, just to loop it back at the beginning part of the video. He's taken that and he's accepted that. There's a level of team collective responsibility we've made from a managerial and a team perspective. Hey, the left side wasn't supported. Let's support it. And there's this amalgamation between the two. There's individual, team collective. That makes for a happy George. That's it. <laughs> yeah, if he's here, let's use him, you know. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's encouraging. And I hope 
hopefully we're going to see that sort of with the other assets as well that we could we could talk about we want to talk about Fabio Vieira at some point we want to talk about uh yeah timber and jesus and stuff but we will we'll get to all of those i'm sure across the season um yeah go check out the rewatch if you haven't uh, for patrons there's a free trial on patreon if you want to go check that out it's also available for youtube members um we'll be back with another pod on monday we're back with the instant reaction after the premier league gets kicked off on saturday saturday how exciting how exciting we will be there we will be there thank you george thank you so much and guys make sure you guys like comment subscribe i don't know if we normally do that but you know we love your support leave us a comment or a hate comment we love both (laughs) they all work it's all engagement (laughs) uh thanks for being here and thanks for keeping it arsenal